Father in heaven, we thank you for your people. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. Thank you because of the great things you've done for us in this Congress. I'm praying for your people as they go back home, you'll protect everyone. I pray that all throughout this year, for everyone here, it will be joy untold. It will be joy unspoken of. It will be joy multiplied in Jesus' name. And I'm asking, O oh Lord, your blessing will be abundant upon your people. You prepare us for the coming of the Lord. And you prepare all our members for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Keep on standing and read with me after me my commitment. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have this Holy Spirit's power. The die is cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away. I won't be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secured. I am finished and done with low living. With sight walking. With small planning. With smooth knees. With colorless dreams. With tame visions. With mundane talking. With cheap living, with dropped goals, I no longer need preeminence or prosperity or position or promotions or plaudits or popularity. I don't have time to be right, to be forced, to be top, to be recognized, to be praised, to be regarded. Or to be rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I live by prayer. I labor by power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way raw. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear, I cannot be bought, or compromised, or deterred, or lured away, or turned back, or deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, or hesitate in the presence of the adversary, or negotiate at the table of the enemy. Or ponder at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. Shut up. Let up. Until I've stayed up. Stood up. Prayed up. Paid up. Preached up the cause for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach until all know. And walk until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. The Lord has challenged us instructed us led us forward answered our prayers and he has led us in the way we ought to go and now as we come to the end and the conclusion of this congress we need to think about the future ahead of us the things we need to do and what the spirit of the lord is saying telling us at this very time Obviously, as you have been hearing from all those messages from the churches, 
you will have seen what the Lord himself is expecting from us. Because when he finished the message to the church of Ephesus, he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, what the Spirit is saying, and what the Spirit continues to say to everyone, to the churches. And so as he tells us, he's saying, we've lost our first love before we came, our first commitment, our first consecration. And he says, we should remember where we were before. What was the first love? The warmth of affection and the power of that love that we had before. The universality of that love with no discrimination, with no tribalism we had before. Get it again. Remember. Do the first works. Repent. And then he tells us from the church in Smyrna. He told us that although the people said they were poor, but they were rich in faith. And they were rich in the grace of God. And he challenged us again in that place. He said, fear none. Fear nothing. Be faithful to the very end. Then I will give you a crown of life. And he tells us there that we must keep on remaining faithful. Faithful to the Lord. Faithful to our calling. Faithful to the vocation wherewith we are being called. Then again he says, if you will have ears to hear all that the Spirit is saying to the churches, is saying that you will not be hurt in a second death. And then he comes to us again and he tells us, now, I know your works, I know your service, I know your charity, I know your labor. And then he says, I know your works again. Because I see this last work to be more than the first. But I have this against you. All those Nicolaitans and those holding the doctrine of Balaam, those people that are there corrupting the flow of the pure river of life that is coming through the preaching of the gospel, deal with that issue. And you must repent. He told them to repent again of all the carelessness. He told them to repent again of all the insensitivity to the spirit of the Lord and to the watch of the Lord. Again, he's telling us, it wasn't too late telling the church in Pagamos. He was saying what the spirit is saying to Pagamos, he's saying to all the churches. And so he wants us to be overcomers. And as it comes to Tyra, you remember? Uh, he tells us that over there, there was somebody, a woman, making herself a prophetess. And I did tell you at that time that that so-called prophetess had not been appointed by the people of God. She appointed herself. She wouldn't honor anyone. She wouldn't accept the authority of any leader, of any pastor, of any leadership. And she puts herself there. And we have not appointed her. And the Lord is saying, we should repent from that, that kind of self-will, that kind of self-appointment, that kind of getting into a kind of ministry that we have not given you. Maybe it's a prayer pattern that we have not shown you. Maybe it's a kind of doctrine we have not revealed unto you. Once again, it says, I've given you space to repent. But in the case of this Jezebel, she repented not. But then he, told, he said, for the rest of you, that do not have this doctrine, that do not have this, this that do not have this self-appointed attitude, I will lay no other burden upon you. The only burden I'm laying upon you is that the things you have heard, you will continue till the very end. And he that holds my word, to the very end, I'm going to make him a ruler. He's going to reign with me. Hold fast, therefore, what you have, that nobody will take your crown. What the Spirit said to that church in Tatira, the Spirit is saying unto all churches, and as we're going back home, you want to separate yourself from every self-appointed Jezebel, every self-appointed Balaam, everyone that's appointed, uh, that appoint themselves, and they will not listen to the leadership in the church. You close your ears to them, and you want to stand on the watch of God. I told you when we were dealing with that case, that when the message of the word of God finished, by the pastor, by the leader there, 
Then that Jezebel, with all the other followers of Jezebel, they'll be outside there and they'll be saying, never mind what they're saying. And they'll be picking holes, puncturing everything that has been said. And it will be turning your mind. You'll be saying, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. That's how they talk. It's not as hard as that. And today, as you finish the Congress, and you go out there, you might discover some Jezebel, self-appointed people that will contradict the word of the Lord. For them, all that we're hearing here, straight from the throne of the Almighty God, does not matter to them. Close your ears to them. If anyone comes to you and brings not this doctrine, receive them not into your house, neither bid them God's speed. Because he that biddeth them God's speed is partaker of their evil deeds. And when judgment comes on them as all false prophets, false prophetesses, a judgment will come upon you too. So beware. And then to the church inside, he said, if you have a name that you live, you are active, you are dynamic. And it appears everybody is thinking everything is okay with you. But you are dead. There are so many dead members in that church. And again, the Lord was saying, remember how you have received. And then you repent and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Pastors, leaders, overseers, we came here this week not to waste time. Not to entertain you. It's to remind ourselves in your locations, in your regions, in your local government, in your provinces, in the places you come from, there are some people, they are not totally gone yet, they are going. They are not totally dead yet, they are dying. They're still there in the physical, but in the spiritual, they do not have the life of God in them. And their ears are blocked to the truth. They are dull of hearing. They go to retreats, they come back, nothing seems to have happened. And the Lord is saying, go back home and be vigilant and look at the state of your flock. And make sure that the things that are ready to die, you pump life, spiritual life, eternal life into them. And help those who are ready to die, bring them to life again. And now he tells us this wonderful church, Philadelphia. And the Lord is telling us that this is how your church ought to be. That the Lord will not have anything to say against the church. That he just says, I know your works. And I know the blasphemy of the people that say they're Jews and they are not, but they are the synagogue of Satan. Don't mind them. I'm going to make all those people bend the knee and bow before you. In fact, I have the key the final authority, and I open the door, and nobody can shut it. I'm telling you that as you are going back home, the open door of opportunity, of ministry, is open to you in Jesus' name. And nobody will be able to shut that door. Then the Lord said, I shut the door. God is going to shut the door against sickness for you. Against infirmity for you. Against affliction for you. Against poverty for you. Against defeat and failure for you. And it says, when I shut the door, nobody can open it. Then he encourages us, he says, because it's the first and the last. Because it's the very beginning, the origin, the originator, the author, the first cause of the creation of God. And he has all power. Therefore, you can go ahead. You will succeed in Jesus' name. And he says, see that has an ear to hear. How, how can the Lord mention it so many times, so many times, so many times? He that has an ear to hear, he that has an ear to hear. And then we've been hearing that he that has an ear to hear since Tuesday till Wednesday till Thursday till Friday until this morning. I will not have ears to hear, you will hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then he tells us, Laodicea, he said, I'm so surprised about you. I'm concerned about you, Laodicea, because you are neither cold nor hot. And you are lukewarm. And because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And the Lord was outside already. He was outside already. He was outside that church. That's why he said, I'm not inside now. I'm outside. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
As you look at the state of your church, and you look at the confusion in your church, and you look at the sin in your church, and you look at the backsliding in your church, and you look at the lack of evangelism in your church, and you look at lack of holiness in your church, and you look at the lack of pure love in your church, it's not Jesus Christ outside. And he said, there is no grace within because I'm not within. It says there's no power within because I'm not within. I'm outside and I'm knocking at the door. If anyone will hear my voice and he will open the door, I will come in unto him and sob and supper and fellowship with him. The Lord is knocking. And before you go back home, if you have lost the grace and you have not received yet the fullness of the grace of God, the fullness of the power of God, and the fullness of everything that comes with Christ is knocking at the door. And you can still receive everything he as for you before you go, it will happen in Jesus' name. Now, after listening to all that, now we come, and we want to say, as we're going back, what are we going back to do? What's the responsibility that the Lord has laid upon us? It is this, preparing the church for Christ's return. Preparing the church for Christ's return. You have a responsibility you have a ministry, focus on that ministry. Focus on that responsibility. Focus on that goal. Focus on the thing the Lord has appointed you to do. In 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king. And he said, thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall, thou, shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be thyself as decided, determined it. This prophet, although he was actually using an illustration, it was, it was like Nathan, Nathan came to David and then said something, and then he said, Eventually thou art the man. The king here, it was the one that the prophet was talking to. The Lord had delivered unto him Ben Hadad, but he didn't do what the Lord expected him to do to Ben Hadad. And so this prophet came and gave this illustration. And the illustration is for you and for me that a man was delivered to him to be kept, to be kept, to be kept. The people that the Lord has delivered into your hand, born again people, members of the church. The reason they have been delivered to you is so that they will be kept in the kingdom of God. But then this prophet said, as I was busy here and there, not idle, but busy on non-essentials. Busy on irrelevant things. Busy on the work that had not been given to him to do. Busy on the things that will not be rewarded in eternity. As I was busy here and there. Then it says, the man was gone. I've lost the man. I've missed the man. And I want you to think about it now. The thing that the Lord has told you to do. He has not told you, please, to change Nigeria. Or to change any country. Don't fly off in politics. And say, I'm going to change the country. Here we are today. The leaders. The governors. The politicians that have told us and have told you in your states that they are born again before they came in. And after they came in, and some of you allowed them to come to your churches to come and talk and brag how born again they are. How better is that state compared with before they came in? The responsibility God has given you is not to be a politician. It's not to change the country. The responsibility is that you have people that are born again. And they are in the church. Keep them in the kingdom and keep them in the Lord. And prepare them for the return 
of Christ. And we're not called to change the church world. You'll never be able to change the Catholic Church, or the Anglican Church, or the Methodist Church, or the Celestial Church, or all these other churches. That's not your calling. Let them do what they're doing. You do what the Lord has called you to do. The people that are born again, the children of God, the members in your congregation, the Lord has given you, stay with them. Stop running up and down, even within deeper life. I told you before, some people leave their congregation and they will not prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And they are up and down, up and down. They invite them to this state and that state and this state. One of our national overseers that just went to a new country. When he got over there, he called me on the phone and he said, uh, I, I want to invite, uh, then he mentioned the name. Uh, the brother coordinating a uh, Yoruba work here in Lagos. I want him to come so that with his team of Yoruba people in Lagos, they'll come to my country. There are many Yoruba people there. I said, no, sir. He has enough here to do. I want him to concentrate on his primary assignment, the work he has been given. I'm stopping all the running about and then the people that you are in charge of. Many of them are backsliding and they're not living the life and we're not preparing them for the coming of the Lord. That's why we're stopping all these uh, running about. Mary, go around, go here, go here, go there by anybody. And I told you, we have organized the work here in Lagos so that people are not too busy. They lose their souls, they lose their families, and they lose members. And the people that are under them, backsliding, not living the life, and not projecting the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, and yet they are running about. We're stopping all the running about here. Stop it in your area. Preparing the church for Christ's return. And then you will see over here that uh, say, that man said, the man is gone, then the Lord, uh, that king said, so will your judgment be. That's exactly what the Lord is saying. In Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the watch at my mouth and give them warning for me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Ezekiel, the Lord was saying, I've given you your primary assignment. If you neglect your primary assignment and you are busy here and there and they die in sin, the people that ought to have been warned, convicted, converted, and saved, but because you didn't do your duty, if they die in sin, well, they die because of their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. It means if they go to hell, if they perish, you'll follow them there. Yet, if thou want the wicked, and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Did you hear that? Yet if you warn the wicked, as somebody may be quick to tell me, and say, Pastor, you are preaching holiness, holiness, holiness. And you see that the people are not, not everybody is changing. Those who don't want to be holy, they are still not holy. Why don't you stop? Why don't you keep quiet? Because, after all, they are not hearing. Yes, I'll still keep on talking. I'll keep on preaching. Being born again. Having a change of life. And repenting. Not everybody will repent. That will be their problem. I've set you up, the Lord said. Warn the wicked. And if the wicked people do not repent, they do not change, their blood will not be upon me. Yet if thou want the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. I'll be clear before the Lord. When I preach the restitution, not everybody will accept. 
those who don't accept, they have heard. And the judgment will come upon them for being rebellious against the word of God. I've delivered my soul. And when somebody hears the word of holiness, sanctification for this is the will of the Lord for you. Even your sanctification. And a fellow does not hear, I've discharged my duty. I've done what the Lord has called me to do. That's the person that has a problem. Because without holiness, he shall not see the Lord. And I've told him. Now, that's what we're to do. Don't get discouraged. That, you know, we're preaching it and preaching it. But preach it well. Find a better way to preach it. And demonstrate it to you. And go to the people, see where they are and how they are living. Do your best by action, by preaching, by everything. Be a model to them. And then if after all that, they still will not obey, then you can say, praise the Lord, I've done what the Lord told me to do. But make sure you stay at your post of duty and do what you ought to do. Again in verse 20, when a righteous man does turn, from his righteousness and commit iniquity. And I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. A righteous man. A righteous man. You have not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. And his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require to your hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. And that's the reason as we finish uh, this congress, this time, and you are going back home, uh, you want to concentrate on the responsibility and the duty that the Lord has laid squarely on your shoulders. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And it shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Can you look up here a moment? Uh, young people there, school leaders and student reps and whatever you are doing, listen to me. The kind of ministry that prepares young people for the kingdom of God is a kind of ministry that will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. If in an effort, in an attempt, to be very much effective in our youth ministry. And we want to earn the respect, the authority, and build a wall, impenetrable wall around the youth ministry. So that the region overseer, the state overseer, the local church pastor will not be coming there every time and saying, can you do this way? Can you do this this way? Can you do it this way? We don't want that pastor to be coming. We want the pastor to respect the youth ministry. And we want to build an impenetrable wall around that youth ministry. And then we we'll begin to teach those children against their fathers, against their pastors. You will not prepare them for heaven. Already we know the culture of rebellion in the world, and the culture of disobedience in the world, and the culture of self-will. It's in the world. And these children going to these schools, they already have that culture of rebellion, disobedience, and self-will. If in our youth ministry, what we're doing is turning the minds of the young people away from the leadership of the church. That's not the ministry the Lord has called you to. The ministry the Lord has called you to is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children unto the fathers and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Then it said to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You see that? That's our ministry. You ask yourself in everything that you do. It's at the end of that verse 17 to make ready. Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so you're asking yourself, are we preparing these children for the coming of the Lord? 
in the instructions we give them, in the exhortations we give them, in the encouragement that we give them, and in all the other things we are sharing with them. Do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. Are you preparing them for the coming of the Lord? Women, here is our ministry. Here is our ministry, not church administration. It is not you, you know, uh, what a man can do, a woman can do. Why are we not doing this? Leave all that alone. The women that are under your care, under your ministry, in the women ministry, in everything that you do, you are asking yourself, are these women born again? Are they separated from the world? Are they real children of God? Are we preparing in our women ministry? Are we preparing these women for the coming of the Lord? That's the challenge the Lord is bringing to us today as we're talking about preparing the church for Christ's return. There are three points we're going to look at. Number one, prophetic scriptures on Christ's imminent return. Prophetic scriptures on Christ's imminent return. Number two, preparing saints for the church's imminent rapture. Preparing saints for the church's imminent rapture. Number three, purified saints ready for Christ's imminent return. Purified saints ready for Christ's imminent return. Number one, prophetic scriptures on Christ's imminent return. As you look at the scriptures, you'll see prophecies on the fact that Jesus is coming again. John chapter 14, from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, I am in mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's his return. It's coming again. And he gave the word himself. And you know what he said? He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. If I go, and he went, and prepare a place for you, that's what he's going to do. I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Matthew chapter 24. That the Lord says is coming again. And these are prophetic scriptures. Emphasizing, assuring us. That definitely. Whatever may happen in the world. And whatever the devil may do. The devil and the demons and the world cannot hinder. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ's return. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So likewise ye. When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. If you look at it from the beginning of, chapter, of this uh, Matthew chapter 24, you'll see the fulfillment of a lot of things that are already written there. And the Lord is saying this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only but as it as the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the son of man be for in the days that were before the flood they were Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And you can see that all around you. The attitude of people, the preoccupation of people, 
marriage, 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 wedding, eating, drinking, buying vehicles, buying property, buying land, eh, their lives are just taken away with amassing and acquiring, accumulating the things of the world. And the Lord said, when you see that happening, know that the Lord is coming. But the Lord has given you responsibility. In verse 20, 44, Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. The Lord is coming again, and the Lord wants us to bury the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. Acts 1, 9, and when he, Christ, had spoken these things, speaking to his own disciples, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as they went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, actually two angels, appearing as men, clothed in white, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken off from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So you see then the certainty of the Lord coming. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That is as definite as death is. So is definite the coming of the Lord again. He said in verse 27, death is definite. It's once uh, it's been applied, it's been appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. He said, in the same way, as certain, as sure, as definite, as death is upon humanity. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time. He's coming again. And when he comes again, he'll not be bringing sin offering anymore to rescue us from sin. He'll be coming to judge the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 51, chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's telling us about the coming of the Lord. How certain it is, how sure it is that the Lord came before in fulfillment of prophecy. That again, in fulfillment of prophecy, the Lord is going to come again. And then when he comes again, the dead shall rise with his incorruptible body. And then we who are still alive, our bodies will be changed, will be transformed, will be transfigured, and then we'll go with the Lord. I'm sure you know this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, from verse 13, still talking about the prophetic scriptures on Christ's imminent return. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain 
unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, shall not proceed, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, or the voice of the archangel, or the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And can you see how definite that is? The Lord is coming again. And it's emphasized that over and over and over again. Prophetic scriptures on Christ's imminent return. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast. Which thou hast, lest no man hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. That means he'll come suddenly. He'll come unannounced. And you will not know when the Lord will come. And you'll not be able to prepare yourself. This is a time to prepare. But as for his coming, it's coming. And it's definite, it's certain, it's sure, it's imminent, it's soon to be. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see his shame. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Verse 20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming. I said the Lord is coming. If the Lord is coming, what's your responsibility as a minister, as a worker in the vineyard of the Lord? Preparing saints for the church's imminent rapture. Preparing the saints for the coming of the Lord. You as a child of God, you as a minister of the gospel, you as a worker in this church, what the Lord has called you to is that you'll prepare the church for the imminent rapture. It's soon to take place. I want you to begin to examine in your own heart how you've been carrying on in your ministry. What's in your mind? Are you thinking of preparing the people of God for the imminent rapture? Or are you just having ministry, just preaching, just organizing? Just having administration and just looking into this and looking into that. Would you know that the centrality of your calling, the centrality of the expectation of the Lord upon your life in your ministry is to prepare the saints for the coming of the Lord? It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When he gives you something to do, know the details of his expectation. And then make sure that you um, comply with that expectation, the purpose of ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Once again, it's not self-appointment. It's not self-appointment. He gave some. Let no man, let no woman put himself, put herself where the Lord has not put you. He gave some. Apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers. And sometimes I, I sometimes wonder in a church like this. There are people that will ridicule, reproach, insult, make fun of the appointment of the Lord. 
and he might in their own way of making a caricature of a ministry appointed by the Lord. Or they might say, evangelist, evangelist. But when you say that, if the Lord has appointed that man to be an evangelist, and then you just ridicule, you reproach, you insult, you are sinning against the Lord, not against the man. At other times, it may be that somebody is busy talking about the prophecy of things to come, of the Lord Jesus has coming again. The first Sunday, he talked about the rapture. Another time, the second coming. Another time, another prophecy. And it's just busy looking at it because the Lord has appointed him to remind the people of God about the prophecy of things to come. And then somebody will stay in the corner. While that fellow is coming and say, Prophet, prophet, prophet. You're not ridiculing him, man. You are making fun of the Almighty God himself. He's the one that's appointed. And sometimes it's a teacher that somebody comes in and as a Bible, uh, some of you, uh, maybe because you are not teachers, some of you have this mo uh, small Bible, the uh, ten cover Bible of those days. And the thing is so small, when we open it, we cannot even see the print. But some of us who are appointed teachers of the Word of God. Because Paul the Apostle said, the Lord has appointed him, a teacher, to the Gentiles. Then I have this big Bible here with commentary, with references, with everything. Because the teacher needs to have a Bible like that. And then I teach the Word of God, line upon line and precept upon precept. And I'm not ashamed of that. That's my calling. That's what the Lord has appointed me to do. And then somebody might say in the corner there, when I'm coming, I say, teacher, teacher. I don't answer you because God will answer you. Because it's the appointment of the Lord that this is a teacher appointed by the word of the Lord, by the spirit of the Lord, and he set me in place so that I can teach you line upon line and precept upon precept. If we're not careful, we can take laws into our hands and begin to ridicule sacred things, essential things, Things that have eternal value. When you come back to your spiritual self, and please understand that in the church, it's a sacred matter. And whether it's apostle or prophet, evangelist or pastor or teacher, you honor, you respect that ministry is unction from above. Now, why was that ministry given? We're told in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. Aren't you surprised? As a husband is talking to the wife after the congress on the table. How was, how did you see the congress? I don't know. Did you hear him the way he was talking? He wants everybody to be perfect in one congress. And then the fellow will, will say, and it will never happen. You're not a believer. They may call you coordinator, pastor, overseer, whatever. If you're discussing at home with all that God has done and all that God is doing and everything we're reading and the purpose why the Lord has set up the church and the purpose why the Lord has raised up the ministry is for the perfecting of the saints. Uh, he wants everybody to be perfect and it will never happen. It's just spending his energy, sweating for nothing, wanting everybody to be perfect. It will never happen. No church is perfect. Ah, you didn't get anything. How about the church in Smyrna? How about the church in Philadelphia? If God did it for them, and there was no blame, there was no sin, there was no iniquity, and the Lord perfected them, and the Lord praised them. Why are you saying there is no church that is perfect? And you are not even going to make an attempt and do what the Lord has called you to do. That he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. The problem we have in this church at the present time is not the problem with preaching here. We preach well here. The problem is after we have laid everything down and we have stored everything up and we have explained everything, analyzed everything and there is conviction and there is prayer and there is desire. The problem is outside that gate. There are some of us inside here 
that will tear down everything in the bus, in the vehicle, while you are going back home. And a person will speak to another fellow, what did you get there? What did I get? I didn't get anything. What do you mean? I didn't like the way the general superintendent was just shouting. Why is he shouting like that? Why am I shouting like that? If you come to the pulpit here and you see a crowd, and I want to talk to those people far at the back. If you are here, you will shout. If you cannot shout, you will never get here. If you, if you really go shouting, or see shouting like that? It's shouting like that because of the anointing. It's shouting like that because of the power. It's shouting like that because he wants the perfection of the church. And if you are not willing to give your voice, give yourself, shout like that, you'll never get here to do it. The perfection of the saints. It says, so that for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And then somebody will stand outside there and say, uh, be united, be united. All these 1977, 1978 concepts, when we were just a few people and everybody was united, that's what he's looking for, that's what he's asking for, that's what he's preaching for. Now, with all these thousands of people, there will never be unity. You are an unbeliever. And you are pumping, projecting that unbelief in the balls while you are going back home. And God marks you down that this is an unbeliever. He went a whole week to that congress. What he took away is an unbelieving heart. The purpose of God. And the plan of God and the desire of God is that as we minister, you do your part, I do my part. He does his part, she does his part. The reason is until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto, unto what? Tell me out loud. Ah, unto a perfect man. Why don't you then make an attempt? Why don't you make up your mind? That the ministry of the word, the ministry of the spirit, is to make us perfect until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what he wants. That's how to prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. It tells us, husbands, love your wives. Don't love another person's wife, just your wife. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having sport. That's what he wants. A glorious church, not having sport or wrinkle. Or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the kind of church he wants when he comes by because he says he'll present it unto himself. That's why you are a minister. And that's exactly what you are to do. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you. A servant of Christ salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand, what's the next word? Perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's the plan of the Lord. He wants you to be perfect in all the will of God. And that's the reason why you as a minister, you as a preacher, here is the responsibility you have, and here is what you ought to be doing. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. As you are going back in your personal life, abstain from all appearance of evil. As you are going back in your interaction, discussion with another brother, another sister, don't destroy other people's faith. And don't destroy other people's convictions. And don't destroy other people's vows. Don't destroy other people's consecration in ministry. 
I've had the word of God. I want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. And then you will say, ah, is it as serious as that? Do you know sometimes even the preachers themselves can do that? I remember many, many years ago, I had a message, and it was a message of real consecration. Give yourself to the Lord. Sacrifice everything. Lay everything you have on the altar. Your life, your certificate, your money, everything. And live on the barest minimum and pump and pour every other thing into the spreading of the gospel. When I had that message, I was already a graduate from the university, and I was already somebody that the church I was going, they thought I should live a little big, bigger than I was living. When I had that message, I just went on my knees, and I did exactly what that preacher said. And I said, Lord, I lay everything on the altar. And it so happened, it just happens that the same today, that I was wearing a short sleeve shirt as, I, as I'm wearing now. And all the other people, primary six, uh, certificate holders, and mechanics, and drivers, and other people in that church, if they didn't have money, they went to borrow money and bought coat and, you know, a tie, and, you know, they were like executive people. I didn't look at them. I wore my short sleeve and, you know, went to the church. And then I came out of the church, the same pastor, the same pastor that preached about lay it on the altar, pour it out, and put it on Christ, and give everything to the Lord, and live on the barest minimum, and serve the Lord. He called me, and then I, I answered him, I was in his presence. And then he pulled the sleeve of my short sleeve shirt and pulled it like this, and said, look at what you are wearing. See this, see this. You are a graduate. That one is just primary six. That one is just like mechanic. And see, see out there, like executive. And see how you are. I said, sir, I'm doing this because of the way you preached the other day. I reminded him of the text. I reminded him of the message and everything. He said, yes, I know I preached that. But I said, I'm sorry, sir. Once I hear it on the pulpit, the boat you are telling me at the car park, I don't hear. I told that preacher. There are some preachers, they've done it to me. They preach it straight. They preach it firm. They preach it serious. This preacher I'm talking about, he'll be preaching it, he'll be crying on the pulpit. And I took him serious. And I went on my knees. And I prayed, and I made my dedication, and I said, Lord, I give up everything. Deeper life had not begun at that time. It was that consecration that made me to say, God, whatever it will take, I will do something in this generation. On the basis of his preaching, when I got to the car park, he called me. He said, why are you dressing like this? Be like an executive. I said, no, sir. I said, you preach it. He said, yes, I know. But, I said, no, no but. Don't destroy what you told me on the pulpit. Don't destroy it at the car park. I told him. Many of us today, you don't understand. That's what the, the way I am. That's the way I am. I've been like this for years. More than 30 years before Deeper Life started. And I'm still like this. My slippers are still on my feet. And I'm still a graduate. And they call me general superintendent. But that title does not get into my head. They call me pastor. That title does not get to my head. My consecration is still there. My desire to serve the Lord until he comes is still there. I'm not going to be lukewarm until he comes. I'm going to be getting on fire more and more. I'm going to still make many more consecrations to the Lord. And you younger people that are coming behind... And we'll preach it here to you. And somebody will stand at the car park. I will smile and laugh and say, I am overseer. I am pastor. I am so and so. Don't take it exactly as they are saying like that. Tell him, I will take it as they are saying it like that. Because I believe 
there is more anointing on the pulpit than you have in the car park. There is no anointing in the car park. The anointing is here on the pulpit where the Spirit of God is speaking to us. And whatsoever the Spirit says unto the churches, do it, you will do it. You will prepare the believers for the coming of the Lord. You preach to save souls. And you lead Christians to experience purity of heart. And to maintain that holiness challenge backsliders in your church. To return and warn them of being unruly, being disobedient, and being disrespectful to the word of God. Encourage the pursuit of righteousness and lessen emphasis on material wealth. Aim at transformation. Aim at consecration in your messages. Involve only ministers having passion to prepare believers for the rapture. If you bring a preacher on the pulpit and see her just entertaining the people, and he doesn't know that the reason we have ministry is to prepare people for heaven, that will be his last chance. Let him go and pray until he understands what ministry is all about. Remove those whose lives and messages encourage worldliness and carnality. Preach God's grace, God's love, God's transforming power, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Preach that often. That's the calling the Lord has given you. I pray you will not fail. I said, I pray you will not fail. Abstain from all appearance of evil. All this talk, talk, all these discussions, all this sharing, all this careless thing that we're talking with one another, that in one day we will destroy the effect of a whole week of Congress. Let's stop that and abstain from every appearance of evil. Then he tells us in verse 23. In verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that calleth you who also will do it. The Lord will do it. I said the Lord will do it. In Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 40. In Luke 12, verse 40, here is what it says. Be ye therefore ready. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But, and if that servant shall say, in his heart, the Lord delayeth, my Lord delayeth his coming. And shall begin to beat the maid servants and the maid servants and to eat and to drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at a time, at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and that minister, which knew his Lord's will, and that worker, which knew his Lord's will, and that congress participant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. I pray you will escape the judgment of God. I pray you'll escape the many strives. You know the Lord's will already. You know what he wants already. He wants you to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. He wants you to help the believers, the saints of God, to be ready, prepared for the coming of the Lord. You know his will. I pray you will do it. Point number three. Purified saints ready for Christ's imminent return. Purified saints ready. For Christ's 
imminent return. The people that will be ready for Christ's imminent return will be saints. And it can come at any time. And you better keep yourself ready every time. And every time you come to church, every time you come for Bible study, any time you have anything to do at all in the house of the Lord, you say, I don't know, this may be the last service I'm rendering to the Lord before he comes. Because one day he will come. And I want to do it with all, my, all the seriousness, earnestness, conviction, that passion that I have within me. Be ready. Be a purified saint. Purged saint, holy, righteous, sanctified, and the Lord totally cleansing you. You remain clean, pure, righteous, upright, and holy every time, so that whenever the Lord will come, you will not regret. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, verse 34, and take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, the cares of this life. The cares of this life. The cares of this life. When you look up here for a moment, you know that as your pastor and Somebody who loves you, I, I declare the word of God to you. It's very difficult for some other pastors outside. And even some, some pastors here. It, it, it pastors, many pastors now, they don't like to say what people don't like to hear. They only like to say what people want to hear. They don't like to say what the people don't want to hear. I knew this many, many years ago. That major cities of the world, Christianity in major cities, metropolitan cities, mega cities, the Christianity normally will be at a low level. Why? Because living in a major city, mega city like Lagos, for example, like Portacot, like Onitsha, like Weary, like Kaduna, for example, some of these big major cities, the cares of the world is much because of the cost of living, because of making money, because if you are not fast, if you are lagging behind, the people get the market before you. And because of that cares of life, and because we need to get it, we need to rush, we need to have it, it affects the service. It affects our prayer. It affects our preparation for heaven. It affects virtually everything. Because when you rush, when you hurry, when you rush, when you hurry, when you rush, when you hurry. And all our workers, please, wherever you are working, you are to help us exalt, lift up the word of the Lord. The message, the preaching, is the climax, is the most important thing in the church because it is what prepares us for heaven. I've said it before, but some of you are not in Lagos, so I'll tell you again. It's good we have food at the congress, at the retreat, at the conference, whatever we do. It's good we have food, but that food we eat will not take us to heaven. That food we eat is to make us have energy and strength to sit down and hear the word of God, which is going to take us to heaven. The ushering is wonderful. The security is wonderful. Well, you see, as we're orderly here, the orderliness is good. The orderliness in itself does not take us to heaven. The orderliness is to help us be orderly and quiet and receive the word of God. Once the orderliness and the organization and the administration becomes the number one and the word of God becomes the subservient thing, it is wrong. It's the cares of life. See the good, this good choir. The choir is good. 
But the singing does not take us to heaven. The singing is to prepare our hearts ready to receive the word of God. Anything we're doing, choir, usher, security, electronics, whatever, it is to prepare us for the word of God. And once our ministry, what we're doing, becomes so significant, so important, that we have to put pressure on the preaching of the word of God, and we have to hurry up the people that are preaching the word of God so that we leave time for them to go and eat. So that we have time, to, so that the ushers will not have too much difficulty. If it's too late, the organization, this is the large crowd, to organize them. The organization becomes the most important thing, more than the word of God. It's not right. It's the cares of this life. Nobody else will tell you. Because all those other people don't want to get in trouble with usher, security, and choir, and all the other people. They want everybody to be smiling at them. But God should have somebody, even if it's only one person that has to tell you. I will keep on telling you. And I pray that you'll obey in Jesus' name. And ushers and security and members of the choir understand, if God didn't trace me all to preach the word, to gather the crowd, you'll have nobody to sing to. If God didn't give me the gift and the calling and the anointing to get the large crowd together, ushers, you'll not have anybody to usher. And security, you'll have nobody to watch your van. You know, do the work of security. If God doesn't bring a man here to raise up the large crowd, that now you're able to use your skill and your talent to be able to do your security work. Honor the person the Lord has put his honor upon. And understand. It is the effectiveness of the ministry of the pastor that gives you a chance to get the work done. Don't take it over from me and then become the all in all that what you are doing, which is a supportive ministry, becomes the major ministry. And then I'm to stand at the back waiting until you give us chance to preach. It must not be like that. It's the cares of the world. And the word of God must remain number one in the church of the living God. That's how to be ready for the coming of the Lord and take it yourselves. Lest at any time your heart be overcharged with self-eating, with drunkenness, and with the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as, as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray ye always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We'll stand before the Son of Man. I said we'll stand before the Son of Man. The Lord is about to come. His coming is imminent. And all I'm doing, all I'm saying, all I'm preaching is just to contribute my part your spiritual life and your spiritual ministry so that whenever the Lord will come, you will be ready. And I know you are going to be ready. I said you are going to be ready. What wonderful day when the dead in Christ shall rise. And the saints of God, those who are still alive, and then were changed and transformed. And then we'll be going up. We'll be going up and never come down again. And then we'll forever, forever be with the Lord. Problems passed. Conflicts gone. Temptations over. Trials now would have ended. And all the things that you went through in the world, even praying and all that, everything is gone. And then you'll appear before the Son of Man, and you'll be there forever and ever. I've made up my mind I will be there. How about you? I said how about you? I don't know when I will see you again. Who knows the Lord may come before you come back here again. If I don't see you again, we'll meet at the feet of Jesus Christ. Well, if we meet again, I'll still shout on you once again. So just to get you ready. Just to get you ready. Because by the grace of God, we're going to be ready. I said we're going to be ready. Now, we're, uh, we're almost finishing now. And uh, I don't want your mind... Don't throw your mind to the gate and then run after your mind. 
let your mind stay here with me and we're still going to pray do you understand don't let the cares of this life and the cares of getting a boss and the cares of running and running and running don't let it take you away from preparation we are preached and then we're still going to pray let's show that we really love the lord we really want to get ready for the coming of the lord getting to heaven is more important than getting to the gate let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer Why don't you have victory over this chaos of this life? Have victory, complete victory, total victory, complete victory, permanent victory over the chaos of life. Get ready. The Lord will appear, the Lord will come at a time you are not expecting. 